research focuses on the work that we're doing in Guatemala that centers around memorialization initiatives that are taking place across the country in the wake of the genocide and the armed internal conflict. And so in general, genocide memorialization is expanding as a field of inquiry. And this growth is being accompanied by multiple perspectives on the form, the function, and even defining concepts of memorials and memorialization. And so in Guatemala, the efforts to build memorials and expose the crimes of the state are really being led by civil society groups that represent the victims who demand a voice in writing their collective narrative. And so within this context, Martha and I are particularly interested in the attendance of women, both in the process of memorialization efforts and in the memorials themselves. And so just in general, memorials uh, to genocide serve multiple purposes. These include honoring the memory of the victims, symbolic forms of reparation, sites of healing, places to bear witness, and even as aids in truth and justice initiatives. And they're also now performing an educative function to aid in the prevention of further violence through awareness and education. And so uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go extensively into the background, but Guatemala did experience a 36 year armed internal conflict. And the genocidal period roughly spans between 1978, 1983, in which there were large numbers of massacres, uh, massive internal displacement, destroyed villages, refugees, and, and these are all very well documented. And so violence against women, especially during the period of La Violenza was particularly brutal. And so not to essentialize women, but they, they bore Mayan children, but they also transfer cultural identity to the young. And so women were seen as the progenitors of future guerrillas. And so we see a lot of mass rapes committed before massacres, especially in the indigenous villages. And so at the in, end of this era of terror, we find many Mayan women who found themselves as widows, other survivors. Many women were sexually abused, oftentimes cloaked themselves in a veil of silence, and many, many were were left psychologically traumatized. And so their silence in part is driven by the fact that perpetrators continue to live next door to their victims. And so um, we also have to put not just to uh, put this violence against women in the context of war, but also in the context of the broader power structures that victimized Mayan women. The other interesting thing is that not all Mayan women experiences were the same, nor are there post-conflict efforts at memorialization. So some women were kept for months as sexual slaves in military camps. Others were raped by the civilian patrol members, people from their own communities. Others were raped by the guerrillas. So this is not to say that also the guerrillas didn't participate in these sort of heinous acts. Um, and so in this context of, of looking at all this, we are cognizant of the fact that ontologically, Mayan women are situa situated within notions of harmony of the community that also often includes the wider physical environment and even deities. So when we look at women in this representation, it often reflects a communal relationship rather than individualized suffering. Um, Martha, is that? Martha, you're doing the next slide. Yes, I know. Yeah, okay. So as part of the peace process and then the internal conflict, the 1996 Oslo Accord for Freedom and Lasting Peace established the Commission for Historical Clarification, is known as the SEC, and they mandate was to explain why both the government and the guerrillas committed extreme acts of violence that claimed the lives of over 200,000 people this place up to a million and led to the destruction of over 600 Mayan villages. The authors of the same report believe that documenting these atrocities and uncovering the truth of what transpired will foster national reconciliation and promote human rights for everyone. And then the same report also noted the importance of the recovery of the historical memory, both individually and also collectively, as a means of preserving the memory of the victims in accordance with the Oslo Accord. The SEC recommended several measures to achieve the goal, preserving the memory of the victims. This included dignity for the victims, and a victim remembers the fund has the, 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 the sign day of the commemoration of the victims, the building of monuments in the public parks, supported by all levels of government, in naming public spaces after the victims. The construction of memorials in memory of the victims began at the grassroots level, and women, many of whom were widows of the conflict, 
spearheaded many of these efforts. Why the SEC didn't do, it didn't name perpetrators of the, or call for accountability? So how do we approach our study? So we start, we build on this typology of the work of Lewis Bickford and some of the transitional justice folks. And we classify memorializations based on location as to whether or not they're located on an authentic site that is a massacre site or on a more symbolic site and whether the memorials serve what we call either a private reflective role or a public educative function. So private educated, private reflective role would be say a chapel or a cemetery, whereas a public educative function could be more of a museum or graffiti or public murals. And so within this context too, Mayan communities are not homogenous. And so in Robinall, for example, where we spend uh, considerable time doing our work, memorialization is confined only to the collective memory of the Achimaya. And women in this context fought back. They formed civil society organizations, mutual support groups. They participated in the tribunals. And so we tried to unpack our approach to examining the memorials in this kind of relational context. So we look at the effects of the process. Is the intent to convey the notion of never again? Is the intent remembrance? Is it justice? And then also we kept in mind how we as outsiders look at the images. That is, how are the images seen by others? So we would oftentimes have to ask ourselves whether a particular memorial was even intended for our viewing, for example, in a cemetery um, or houses of worship that were more private reflective. And so these memorialization efforts help us to understand how they contribute to breaking this culture of silence and their potential impact on the fight against impunity and this idea of never again. So private reflective memorials function as, so private reflective function as, as places for survivors and communities to heal, commemorate, mourn, honor, remember the victims. So whether they take the form of a chapel, a grave marker in a public cemetery, a memorial altar, or even a clandestine grave, these are primarily what we identified as victim-driven projects that originate at the local level. And so as locally driven memorials, they often represent the universal suffering of the Mayan people, as well as atrocities felt by specific Mayan communities. And while there are untold numbers of clandestine, clandestine graves and other private reflective sites throughout the zones of conflict, we primarily confined our initial research to the area of Rabinal and the Alta and, and Baja Vera Paz, uh, a commemorative chapel in Plan de Sanchez, and then in the area of the Coban. And so cemeteries in the Mayan context are sacred places. These are uh, spaces in which rituals associated with burial and mourning are public acts and the remains of the dead are entombed in accordance with community funeral rites. Yet many of the memorials throughout this region in the Baja and Alta Vera Paz commemorating the victims of massacres who were exhumed from clandestine graves and then reinterred in a public burial space portray these kinds of scenes of, of violent death that are really out of harmony with Mayan spirituality. And so even though many of the remains of the victims have been identified and reinterred, it does not replace the Maya Achi rituals of death that would have brought complete closure to loved ones and the entire community had death occurred as part of a natural cycle. So massacre victims whose bodies were often mutilated and discarded in clandestine graves disrupted up that harmonious relationship between the living and the dead. And this upended these sort of cultural bonds of the community. For those victims that were not buried, the army's counterinsurgency tactics left behind mutilated and, de and desecrated corses, corpses among the ruins of the devastated villages. And so fear often hindered survivors from even returning to the communities to reclaim the dead, as the army would ban surviving families from burying relatives. And if they did return days later, they often found victims devoured by animals and decomposing. So this type of systematic destruction not only physically attacked communities, but it also assaulted the cultural life of the communities, especially the spiritual elements of Mayan life. And so there has been physical and psychological damage on the mental health of unfinished mourning, uh, especially on communities like Plan de Sanchez, who were not able to complete the mourning process until after the exhumations were completed. And that was 1994, a full 12 years after the massacre. So in the Maya Achi culture, this farewell death ritual 
is supposed to establish a new type of harmonious, harmonious relationship between the living and dead that allows the dead actually to look after the well-being of the living. And we see this process play out in dreams where um, the deceased convey these kinds of messages. And these are these sort of tropes that we see later play out in a lot of the memorials, these sort of dreams, uh, 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 um, sequences and so on. And so in turn, the living then ensure that the dead rest in peace by holding the farewell ritual and inter the dead in a sacred place where the living can come to pray, leave flowers, burn candles, commemorate. So it's not possible to maintain this relationship if survivors have not recovered the remains of the dead and laid them to rest in places where they can be honored by the living. So unless properly buried, the souls of the deceased inhabit this liminal space in which they dwell between earth and their final resting place. And as La Violenza intensified, it became extremely difficult to hold traditional funerals out of fear of holding large gatherings and also the inability to obtain funeral necessities such as coffins, food, incense. In sense. So the disruption of the death ritual placed particular hardship on widows who often had to suppress expressions of grief if they were unable to perform funeral rites, especially if there was uncertainty over the whereabouts of their spouse's remains. So this emotional and physical suffering manifested itself on women's bodies in the form of illnesses, uh, the uh, uh, experience of dreams, apparitions of unburied husbands and fathers whose bodies have not been located for a proper burial. Um, and so exhumations then become an important political tool in the hands of the widows because the exhumed sites actually refuted the official government narrative that the family members were guerrillas because when they exhumed these mass graves, there were no weapons found among the victims' remains because in uh, Guatemala, there's an official denial by the state that the genocide took place. Uh, and so in the highlands of Guatemala, the public cemetery in Rabinal contains the reinterred remains of hundreds of massacre victims from that scorched earth policy of the late 1970s and 1980s. So for the museums, we focus uh, mainly in the Casa de la Memoria, Cajitulam, and Para No Olvidar, to not forget, in Guatemala City. And then we have the Museo Comunitario from Ravina. And th that one is the one that the Guatemala City is also the Museum of the Memory. And it functions more like a public educative space. And the museum gives an overview from the creation of the Maya, the conquest, colonization, independence, revolutions and internal armed conflicts with an emphasis on the genocide along with the remembrance space that functions as a private reflective space to memorialize the victims of the genocide and disappear. The Casa de la Memoria also serves as a commemorative site where groups gather in late February, so it's in January, uh, February 25th, sorry, and the, they perform Mayan ceremonies that commemorate the National Day of the Dignity of the Victims of Guatemala Armed Conflict. At this time, women groups gathered together, marching the name of the peace in the capital city of Guatemala. So in the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna discuss the work of the Rabinal community and the establishment of the Museo Comunitario de la Memoria Historia in, in Rabinal. <clears throat> and so this museum, uh, Rabinal is not necessarily on like a tourist stop. Um, so it's it's not one of these sort of like places that if you're in Guatemala and you just happen to be in Rabinal, you're going to, you know, seek out this particular museum. Um, looking at their guest log and their visitor book, most of the visitors to the museum are local uh, or from the capital city. So the museum is just located on a side street. And it's really in this unimposing one story structure that sits within these sort of plastered white walls behind this black metal gate. And so with the exception of the sign above the gate, there's no other identifiable marker pointing to the museum's function. And so inside there's this long and wide outdoor courtyard with a passageway that leads to the museum's permanent exhibit rooms, which there are three, and to a large outdoor area that hosts a lot of community activities. Uh, a lot of the Courtyard walls host banners that contain dozens of these little handmade quiltlets embroidered by the names, embroidered with the names of massacre victims and the disappeared, with the date they perished or whether or when they were kidnapped. And the museum actually credits its establishment to local civil society organizations, chief among them Adi Vima, who founded the museum in 1999 with the aim of reclaiming historical memory and local reconciliation. 
So the museum holds the distinction of being the first museum of its kind to establish a space for survivors of a specific Mayan culture, the Ache, for the remembrance and memorialization of the victims of the violence. And as noted in the uh, Commission for Historical Clarification, the army and the PACs, these were the civilian patrollers, massacred 20% of the Maya Ache people between 1981 and 1983. And so this provided the momentum for the creation of the museum with the mission to re re rescue, recover historical memory, cultural memory, and promote the identity of the Maya Achi. So the museum itself identifies itself as a community museum because it works together with the local communities on their behalf uh, uh, in the pursuit of its objectives. And so interestingly, the founders distinguish a museum, a memorial, and a moral function of the museum along cultural, historical, and educational keystones. Um, inside the museum, there's this gravel path that leads to these uh, permanent exhibit rooms. And the first room uh, is the collection. It's, it's really a very solemn space that's specifically dedicated to the dignification of the victims. And the dark blue walls in the space function to really kind of create a sense of somberness. They draw attention to the illuminated glass display cases that line the walls of the room. Room. And the lighted cases contain dozens of black and white photographs that are mounted against this white background. And engraved on the center post that anchors the room is an inscription in both Spanish and Achi that informs the visitor that they are encountering the memory of their brothers and sisters from various communities in the region who were massacre victims of the genocide between 1980 and 1984. So the images of the victims represent the loss of community, religious leaders, Mayan priests, midwives, healers, artisans, and thousands of others among them, including the elderly, pregnant women. And so at first glance, the black and white identification type photos seem repetitive and nondescript. And so among the sea of these photos, the frontal gaze of each image appears expressionless and gender distinctions seem to be the initial differentiating feature among the images. However, when we get closer and we begin to examine the images, the images convey much more than a binary distinction between men and women. Each image is personal, providing us with the name of the victim. And in many photos, we learn in which community they called home and the date they perished. The more we engage with each individual photo, the more we understand we are staring back at a human being, a real person whose image represented a moment of lived time rather than a death. So it is that understanding that allows us to comprehend the tragic loss among the Aceh community. It also reinforces Marianne Hirsch's notion of post-memory and the utility of photos as images of remembrance and the role of museums that bridge the distinction and the distance between memory and post-memory and between post-memory and oblivion. One recognizable woman among the photos is Paulina Aboy Osario, one of the 70 women killed in the March, 1913, uh, March 13, 1982 Rio Negro massacre, who is also memorialized on the cemetery marker to commemorate that event. event. And so in this context, we recognize that the museum exists to fulfill a moral function as an educative tool for the public in addition to its memorial role for survivors. Among the photos displayed of women, we do not get familial relationships because we don't see the women in their role as mothers, wives, or daughters, nor do we see them in their professional and communal roles as midwives, healers, weavers, and purveyors of Achi culture. We do see their identity as indigenous women because of their distinctive Achi headdress, but the richness of their lives remains out of our reach. The center pillar in the room also contains the engraved names and ages of the children massacred and listed according to their respective communities. Among these include Rio Negro, Picha, Pantcal, Chicopec. And the docent who was with us that one day conveyed to us that the children's engraved names occupy space on the center support pillar because they represent the heart of the Maya Achi community. In the second room is a permanent exhibit and is known as the process of dignification. And it's eight different posters. Uh, it's the color of like a photo murals, line the more brightly painted walls than the subdued blue hue, excuse me, in the previous room. And the previous plan card describes the contents of the posters as a journey, the step process undertaken by the survivors to dignity for the massacre and disappear. So we're talking about like the, how when they, re, they did the denounce, with the public minister and then the when they find the clandestine cemetery they do the exhumation then they meet the family with the remains and they do the wake and the funeral and then the inhumation and then in the slide 
11, we see more of the, it's the third room, we see it's another permanent exhibit of the museum. And it, this one highlights the several of the culture and the central practices identified with the Maya sheet through the combination of the narrative text and photographic visuals. Although the narrative text that accompanies the exhibit, photographs informs, inform us that the genocide destroyed the social fabric of the group. One of the missing objectives is to restore the social fabric and recover cultural practices, particularly those generally associated with women's roles. The narrative text further explains that because of the majority of the, of the survivors experience forced internal displacements, they achieve became separated from the obvious of their material culture, including musical instruments and masks, uh, masks and use in the spiritual practices, access to medical plants, the community food and drinks that define their culture. Featuring the exhibit are a case of archeological objects, a display of masks and musical instruments integral to the spiritual ceremonies and four prominent posters size displays that highlight the importance role of women have fulfilled in the community and the present activities that she life and the culture before genocide. This include the comadrona or midwife, the gastronomia, there's the gastronomy, the curandera or the healer, and the spirituality or spiritualidad. We also spent some time in, uh, so in addition to looking at private reflective spaces like in cemeteries or altars uh, and or museum spaces. We also look at the public murals that are um, in, in different areas in Guatemala. And so we spent some time in San Juan Comalapa and this was local community efforts that led to creations of murals in both 2002 and 2006. And so this was an association of teachers, artists, students, community members had sketched and painted the history of their the nation, the town and the people for the locals. And the mural stands as a testament to Mayan resistance and one of the few examples actually of compliance with the peace accords. And these murals are sketched on the outside walls of the public cemetery and on a former military barracks across the street. So on the one side of the, on the outside of the um, cemetery walls, the murals are a public voice for the Cacachio Maya. And so if we treat the images as text, we read in the 23 panels, um, these themes that are explained of groups of two to five panels about their origins as, as an indigenous group, the Spanish conquest, colonial period, independence, the liberal period, the armed conflict and the post-conflict peace. And so uh, uh, women in this community here in San Juan Comalapa are one of the active members to teach their children about the genocide because this is not taught in any of the schools, the, 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 the curriculum doesn't cover this. And so they're the ones that promote that mantle of never again or nunca mas. And this is actually causing a little bit of, of some friction because it creates a climate of disbelief because the youth do not believe that a genocide happened. So educating them about the genocide has been a chief task of many of these N NGOs, the Union of Guatemalan Women in, in uh, uh, Guatemala, the coordination of Wid widows of Guatemala, Conavigua, et cetera. And so the, the murals in Comalapa help transmit and remember collectively the massacres and the disappearances in these mine communities. Um, in the old base near the town, many bodies continue to be identified in an effort to bring justice and closure to the families. And we see a number of different interesting tropes that we also see. Uh, some of them have sort of a religious sort of overtones, these tropes of like the uh, mother with dying child, sort of like that pieta kind of thing, uh, women and, and, and dreams. So it's, we get these sort of uh, tropes of th these kind of universalities that we find in other uh, uh, memorialization efforts for other genocides, et cetera. So there's like so a few tropes that, that carry across. And then um, Martha, you wanna advance on some of the... Yeah, we have the yeah. Pompeii here with the women and they talk about one of the also massacres that happened and then you can see like the the the, the woman thinking like what should she could have done you know like studying in some of the roles and then the next one is this one is set up in the school Rafael Alvarez Ovalle and you can see outside of the it's a like elementary school you can see all this mural there and, and then you see how they how it happened so it, it, it portrays you know the the military here and then here we can see the woman and then uh, then you have another set of images of you see a woman looking like in the back so you can see when she's older 
than younger, but she also carries a coffin with the bones in her shoulder. So it's like a looking back and forth. So that's one of the images you can see right here that I'm talking about, like in this image right here in the center, she's on top of bones, but then you can see different sets and then one when she carries the coffin of the, the baby. And this one was also a former military barrack in this area. Then we, and then we have other go ones, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Martha. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that's yours. <laughs> now, this is the one from the, this is the panel of murals in San Cristobal de Paz. And um, they're, they're oftentimes, you know, like telling this particular story. This one um, of the young woman, that's that sort of like a, um, advance to the next one, Martha. This is this, uh, uh, you know, that sort of like, it's like a sort of crucifixion type trope. The other interesting thing that we look at when we look at the images of the women is we also look at the traje and their corte, their um, weight balls and things like that to see if we can get whether or not we're identifying a particular uh, Mayan uh, group or is there a universality to that, uh, uh, you know, to that dress and the traje, et cetera. And I, I, we just found that one particular inter interesting where he had to sort of like kneel to, uh, to shoot this woman. And then this is uh, another example of some of the, uh, the Koban, this is the, the military base. Martha, did you want to talk about this one? This one is Koban, it is known as the like the, now they became Chrome Pass and this use as uh, one of the piece to, 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 to now provide peace. But before it was one of the main sites that they will take for interrogation and all the torture is in Koban. So you can see they portray him like, the, like a devil and then types of the torture they did to them. And then they're burning because of the scorched area. So, so you can see many things is like killing the women and then burning the houses and everything. So. Even God in here, he doesn't want to look at all the atrocities they were doing to them. And then the next one is more of a commemoration memorial that, that we were invited in 2017 after one year of the commemoration of this group of women. It's an important performative memorialization commemoration in the case of the Mayan Kechi women from Serpusarco in February 26. They commemorate the anniversary of the day they won their legal battle against high-ranking military members from Serpur Sarko military base. This base was established in 1982 during the height of the violencia and the women were held as a sexual and domestic slavery victims. This case is important case because it was the first time in which sexual abuse as a weapon of war was tried in Guatemala when the two accused received their respective sentences with the acknowledgement that there were crimes against humanity, the women finally felt sense of justice. At the beginning of the trial, these women were ashamed and stigmatized by their community because they were rape victims. Now they are viewed as an important survivors of the battle for more of the 24 years of, to, to bring justice. The commemorative process along with the transitional justice has allowed these women to transition from victims to survivors that could in foster eventual forgiveness. And, and that's where we went and they took the picture and they, the, this the, the little sign of the, when you enter the town and that's what I was talking about, like at the beginning, they covered their face. Mm -hmm. And then just in the interest of time, we're just kind of just also, we're interested in graffiti and um, the layering of graffiti. And so we've been documenting um, the Sixth Avenue for a couple of years now. And it's kind of interesting because every now and then you'll see this kind of layering. And Martha, do the next slide too. Uh, of graffiti on top of graffiti. And um, a lot of, this is a lot of the work of Hijos. Uh, this is the children of the disappeared. And uh, this idea of where are they? So they're, you know, plastering the walls and, and this idea of don't forget, uh, you know, uh, uh, and things like that. So we're also looking at graffiti as part of these efforts. And then we'll leave you with this last slide. This was, um, we just so happened to be riding down a street and caught a glimpse of that and went back and shot this. and. For us, this is like a really poignant, this is this balance between, you know, memory and justice and things like that. So I think, I think we'll stop there. I think we just about. Yeah.